Uh, so it's our pleasure, great, great pleasure to have Renan Gross on uh, probability and analysis webinar today. Um, it's a last talk for this semester. Um, we will continue, resume next year, I think, at the second half of January. So uh, Renan is from Weizmann Institute of Science, and he will talk about stochastic processes for Boolean profit. Please, Renan. Okay, are we recording? Yes. Yeah, I see the cloud chip. All right, so hello there, everyone. Um, I heard this was a worldwide seminar, so, and I always wanted to travel the world, so now I finally have my chance. And in this talk, uh, we'll talk about functional inequalities on the hypercube. This is joint work with Renan Eldan, who you can see on, on the left here. And I am the person on the right, but I guess you already know that from the camera and everything. Uh, speaking of, of uh, the camera, then feel free to turn uh, your cameras on so that instead of, uh, you know, Zoom's blank faces, you can see other people's blank faces. And during through, uh, throughout this entire lecture, uh, feel even freer to ask questions either in the chat or out loud or whatnot. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Before starting, I should also mention that there are other variants of this talk already recorded and online, but they focus on a different aspect of our paper. Uh, there are three of them that I'm aware of. There's one by me, one by Ronen, and also one animated one, which you may have already seen. I'm posting now the links in the chat, as well as the link to the paper on the archive and to a blog post that I wrote, uh, which is slightly more popular than the paper on the archive. So feel free to watch or read any of this either after or you know, if you're bored during the talk, I won't mind um, whatever, you know, gets you learning. And with that, uh, let's, uh, let's begin. Oh, okay, before we begin, of course, I have to give a warning. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's any small children or anything, but please make sure to have a healthy discussion with them afterwards, okay? We'll be seeing some graphs in this talk. Okay, so who are our main players? Uh, we'll be working over the Boolean hypercube, and you can see a picture of the four-dimensional hypercube over here, uh, minus one, one to the n, okay? And we'll be talking about Boolean functions, which are just functions from the hypercube, and in our case, to minus one or one. Although we'll also have uh, real valued functions later on. And we can think of Boolean functions as the indicators of sets, okay? So let's say that here I called in black the set of all points on which the function's value is one for some function. And since this is a probability seminar, uh, we need some probability measure. And for us, for the entirety of this talk, this will be the uniform measure where every bit is independent from the rest and is one with probability half and minus one with probability half as well. And under this terminology, we can talk about expectations and variances and all of this kind of thing that we like to talk about. Okay, easy. So already with these very uh, few notions, we can talk about different geometric properties of Boolean functions. And for us today, it'll be the following. So first and foremost, the size of the support of F, or you can think about this as uh, the expectation of F. If uh, our functions took values in zero and one and not in plus minus one, then the size of support would be exactly the expectation. But since we are in plus minus one, we also have to do this uh, one plus and divide over two. Okay, as we already mentioned before, the variance, which if you think about it is also a way of measuring uh, the expectation of, of a function, or at least its magnitude, since the variance is symmetric to flipping f to minus f. Okay, you can see it from this equation right here. Okay, these are very basic. Something a bit less basic is the edge boundary of f. Informally, this is just a, you know, a, a way of counting or an average counting of the number of edges that connect the black dots to the white dots in this picture. But along the way, let's introduce some terminology. So, uh, the ice partial derivative of f is pretty much what you'd expect it to be in a discrete setting, okay? Um, it's f evaluated at x where the ice coordinate is set to 1 minus the same thing where the ice coordinate is set to minus 1, okay? So just the difference between um, two points along the same direction. And now you notice that the square of the derivative is 0 if the values are equal, okay? If I have two values which are equal in some direction, um, the square is 0 and it's 1 otherwise. So this is also an indicator and we can look at the expectations of indicators and get probabilities. And we define the ith influence of a function to be the probability that if you change uh, the coordinate, the ith coordinates and you change the function's value. Okay, so this is like the probability and it's actually the expectation of this derivative. Okay, and now here's a nice animation which totally took, didn't, really didn't take too many hours to draw. So if we count all directions, we basically we get all the edges that connect white vertices to black vertices, and this is called the edge boundary, or in Boolean function terminology, uh, the total influence. OK, 
okay, the sum of all influences. Or if you want an analysis terminology, you see that the sum of all influences is a sum of squares of, gra of, uh, of derivatives, which sounds like the norm of a gradient. And that's actually what it is. Okay. So these are some quantities that we'll deal with in our talk. Uh, and lastly, we also talk about the vertex boundary of F. This is a set of all vertices that are connected to a vertex of a different color. Okay, so in this picture, we, we colored in purple all the vertices which are connected to a vertex in a different color. Basically, there are only three which are not in this case. And we can decompose this into vertices which take the value one and vertices which take the value zero. Okay, here we decompose into different colors. And we call this the inner vertex boundary or a partial plus and the outer, outer vertex boundary or partial minus. Okay, so all the sets, all the vertices that are white which are connected and black which are connected. Okay. So now that we have lots of quantities uh, relating to Boolean functions or to sets, if you want to think of it that way, we can start comparing them like good mathematicians. So the first inequality that we'll talk about today uh, is the edge isoparametric inequality. And basically it bounds the edge boundary of a vertex set from below by its size. So suppose we have a set A, okay, which is a support of the function. And we suppose, we assume that the size of A is not too large. Okay, it's smaller than half of the cube, totally legitimate. Otherwise you can just flip, you know, set F to minus F if you want. Then the edge boundary total influence is always larger than uh, the size of the set times log of one over the size of the set. Okay, this is what it says. Uh, we all know edge is like you know uh, is a permitting inequalities on the in R or R n, R squared or R n, and this happens to be the appropriate inequality in the hypercube. It's an old inequality, at least from the 70s, and we know lots of things about it. For example, we know about its maximizers. Uh, the maximizers are subcubes. Okay, so if you take an entire subcube and color it black, then you get a maximizer of, of this inequality. So where this is a a function where the inequality becomes an equality. And if you are really quick, you can actually do the calculations and see that this, this holds true. And you can say a lot of things about subcubes, okay? They are very well structured sets. And we will say only one thing in this talk, which is very, very obvious. For a subcube, any vertex in the subcube is, uh, is in the positive vertex boundary, okay? So for subcubes, the set itself is the boundary, okay? Any black vertex is connected to white vertex, but not necessarily vice versa. So that's our first inequality, very old, very nice, not too complicated. Lots of things are known about it and about its maximizers. Then our may second... I ask one question? Yes. Um, this equality becomes subcubes of which have measure one half or for? Any subcube. Oh. So for example, okay. here you see a subcube with measure one half and here you see a subcube with uh, measure one fourth, I guess. Okay. Okay, our next inequality, the other inequality which we'll talk about today is a Kankalei lineal inequality, also very famous if you're a Booleaner. Um, and this inequality says something else. It says that the variance of a function, okay, we're really again to probability, is always smaller than some constant times the sum of influences divided by log over one over the maximum, uh, sorry, log of one over the maximum influence. Okay, so we can think of the numerator here as, you know, the edge boundary and the denominator is, I, I don't really know. Uh, I don't really have, a, unlike as the parametric inequality, I don't really have a good geometric explanation for, for what's going on here. But you can think of it as sort of an inequality which relates a global variation, that is the variance, to the local variation, that is the influences. Because the variance really talks about, you know, how you compare every two different points of F, and the local influences just say how you go around, around one direction. So this is you can think about it as another variant of an isoparametric inequality, but again, maybe the geometric intuition is lost unless someone in the audience has like something that they want to share. And uh, this constant here, we won't worry about its value. Uh, you can think about it as two if you want. And for this inequality too, we know what the maximizers are, or at least what the asymptotic maximizers are. There are many asymptotic maximizers, and these are the tribes functions. We won't talk about them too much, but know that they exist and we can say all sorts of things about them. What we will talk about is an in improvement made by Telegram in 1994. And he said the following. So the log of the, he replaced this log of the one over the maximum by one plus, okay, the one here doesn't really matter, by log of one over the, you know, specific influence that we have inside this sum. 
So instead of just uh, dividing by the largest thing possible, we divide particular, uh, particular coordinates. This makes it slightly better. Uh, you may also note this as Telegram's L1, L2 inequality. It also holds for real valued functions and also recently for Banach space valued functions up to some slight changes. Um, but in this case, you have to change the influence to something that relates to the one norm of the function and the two norm of the function, which is basically, as we said before, what the influence uh, talks about. So I'll give you a couple of seconds and feel free to memorize this inequality. It's the one that we will be messing around with today for the entire lecture. Any questions? Okay. So I bet you're all really excited to know what we will do today or tonight if any of you are in Israel. So what's on today's menu? Well, now that we know a bit about uh, functional inequalities, let's, uh, we'll start by seeing a neat technique, or at least some of us here think that it's neat, uh, for reasoning about various quantities on the hypercube. And this technique involves uh, a stochastic process which moves inside the continuous cube. Okay, so we're not only dealing with the vertices, but the actual uh, continuous cube uh, minus one, one to the n. And this process represents a noisy Boolean value. And if you are in the know, then you already you know, know all sorts of things about uh, heat semigroups and hypercontraction proofs and stuff like that. I'm just throwing out buzzwords. And these, you know, these kind of proofs effectively go backwards in time. So in these kind of proofs, you usually start from the corner and then do, make a denoising which puts you inside the continuous cube. And this is like a, an approximate value of a function. But here we do the opposite. We start from the center and we go outside. Uh, effectively adding infinitesimal bits of randomness as time progresses. And we'll see this exactly in the next slide, what, what I mean by all of this. So that's the first thing we'll do. We'll look at this cool process. And then we'll use this process to prove Telegram's inequality, which I'm sure you already memorized uh, from the previous slide. And also uh, a strengthening um, of this inequality in the form of what we like to call a stability result. So if you recall Telegram's inequality, had this expression only with this inequality reversed. Okay, Talagrand's inequality said that the variance is always smaller than this right-hand side over here. But now we say something else. If the variance is larger than some other constant times this inequality, okay, so if this inequality is almost tight or almost saturated, these are the terms that we'll be using today, then the inner vertex boundary of the function is large. And by large, I mean larger than some constant times uh, the variance of f. And this constant here depends on this constant here. The c depends on the c prime. And this is also true for the inner vertex boundary as well. So this tells us something about what happens when you are, uh, you know, when you saturate the inequality up to a multiplicative constant, basically. And if you recall, for the isoparametric inequality, you know, subcubes had an equality instead of inequality. And they had large vertex boundaries. And we, this inequality also says something about the isoparametric inequality. So again, we had two inequalities. So as it turns out, if a function f satisfies the isoparametric inequality over here, then it also satisfies, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not satisfies, but uh, saturates the isoparametric inequality. So if this inequality, again, is reversed up to a constant, then it also satisfies this condition, which also means that it has large boundary, which is to say, we are not inconsistent, okay? We saw that, you know, subcubes, they were, they totally, they uh, completely saturated the inequality and they had very large uh, vertex boundaries. And we say that if you saturate the inequality up to a constant, then you also have somewhat large uh, vertex boundaries. That's our stability result, okay? Sort of like you say that, you know, in the standard isoparametric inequality in the plane, you say that uh, if you're close to saturating the inequalities then you're close to a sphere or close to a circle. So it's sort of like this, but much weaker, of course, because we're only close up to a, multi to a multiplicative constant. So that's what we'll do today. We'll see this process, and then we'll see sort of how to, how to use it to prove this inequality over here. <clears throat> OK. Um, and of course, um, I should mention that uh, we'll only be proving this for monotone functions. You can prove it also for non-monotone functions, but this adds a lot of technicality. If you really want the technicality, uh, go ahead and read the paper, but um, we'll not be dealing with that today. And last thing for today, I hope uh, maybe we'll have fun, or at least some of us. I know about myself. I can't, can't say anything about you. you can can I ask one more question? Do you have the reverse implication as well if the measure of the boundary is at most c times variance, then 
uh, variance of f is bounded by from below for monotone functions. Uh, no, because you can make this the vertex boundary very, very large. Like if you consider the parity function, yes. um, the parity function is a function that uh, counts the parity of the coordinates. Or if you want, you just alternate between black and white vertices on the cube. And then the vertex boundary is everything. So it's very, very large. But uh, but the okay. variance is definitely not, but, but all the influences are one. So the variance is definitely not larger than the sum of influences. So actually, it often happens in these kind of inequalities uh, that you know you don't actually get a complete characterization of what it, what influence means or what boundary means. You only get one-sided inequalities, um, usually. Maybe it's, uh, it's an indication that you know we don't we don't have we don't we haven't captured the the true meaning of influence or the true meaning of boundary for Boolean functions yet. Uh, if you watch the other talks that I posted in the in the beginning of the lecture. Uh, you will see other, uh, by the way, other other notions of boundary and, and you know isoparametric inequalities. So other other notions exist. Okay. So let's talk about uh, the diffusion process that I mentioned. Um, I'll just tell you how to build it. It's very nice. So we start with Brownian motion, okay, WT, and we have a sample path right here on the right. And you can actually take any continuous time, continuous path martingale, but we'll take Brownian motion because we like it. And now we ask, um, when does the absolute value of our motion of WT reach a new maximum? Okay, so as it moves along, you know, sometimes it goes back, sometimes it goes up, and sometimes the absolute value reaches a new maximum, and we can take a record of all these times. Okay, and here I drew all the times where the maximum increased. In green, where the maximum of the positive value increased, and in, uh, in red, I guess, where the maximum of the negative values increased. Sometimes it stays constant, sometimes it decreases. So we formally, we define like uh, this uh, time, tau of t, which is the smallest time that we actually, that you know, our motion uh, reached a new barrier, okay? It increased its maximum. And we define a new process, it, we call it bt, which is w at tau of t. So basically whenever tau of t, whenever, uh, sorry, whenever wt reaches a new, a new level, a new level set, then this is going to be the value of bt. And what, what's like the intuition? What, what, should, what should go on around here? Sometimes Brownian motion has a local maximum and then it goes back down. So in this case, you know, if PT was positive for a very long time, suddenly it can flip its sign. Okay, so it's most likely that uh, W will have the same sign, right? Brownian motion likes to stay above, above zero, um, but there's always a chance that it will flip its sign. And this is actually exactly what happens. So it gives rise to a piecewise linear jump process. And here are some sample paths that you can get. And one of its properties is that at all times t, the size of this process is equal to t in absolute value. So it looks something like this. These are all, wherever there's a vertical segment, it's a jump. Okay. And this will be our, our, our motion. It has all sorts of neat uh, properties. So let's, let's see two of them. The first of all is that since tau above, you know, it's uh, let's look up, look at it over here. It's the infimum of uh, whenever the absolute value is greater than something. This is a stopping time. Oh, sorry. So tau is a stopping time, and we are looking at uh, you know Brownian motion stopped at the stopping time. So this bt it's a martingale, which just a very gentle reminder means that if you look at the expected value of bt conditioned on bs, then it's equal to bs for t larger than s. Okay, we love martingales. We can say all sorts of smart things about them. Uh, if you want, you can also make this a right continuous martingale. Uh, and then you can even say even nicer things about them. Something Now that we know that it's a martingale, we can also calculate the probability of, of jumping. So let's denote by P, the probability is that, you know, after after a small time epsilon, uh, we change our sign. Of course, we can, we can change the sign multiple times between, you know, T and T plus epsilon, but we are specifically asking about T and T plus epsilon. So what is this probability it's that you change sign during this small time step? Uh, on the one hand, we know that BT is always equal to T times its, its sign. Okay, just like uh, using the fact that the absolute value is always T. But on the other hand, using the Mart Martingale property, it's also the expected value of BT plus epsilon. And now we can just calculate what, D, what BT plus epsilon is. Either it jumped or it didn't jump. Okay, so. With probability p, it changes sign, and probability one minus p it didn't change the sign. Once you do the calculations, 
you find the probability to jump is you know epsilon over 2t basically and you send epsilon to zero you can convince yourself that we are dealing with a poisson process okay where with independent increments where the rate of jumping is one over 2t so just a quick friendly reminder about these poisson processes so we say that nt is a poisson process with rate lambda t if uh, the increments are distributed like a Poisson random variable, with, with what rate? With rate of uh, you know integral between s and t of, of this rate function, and the increments are independent. That's all we want. And here is an example of a Poisson process. And the process we had before, um, its jump times are Poisson processes basically. And in between, it just goes in the same direction that it started in. You know, nothing nothing special happens there. And one thing we know about uh, Poisson processes, it's very easy for us to say, it's to talk about the quadratic variation. Um, basically, what you do is you take a very fine grid, a very fine mesh, which we denote here by P, we send the mesh size to zero, and we look at the differences in squares of the process. And you know, a Poisson process, it, you know, for all these flat regions, it really doesn't move. So all you care about eventually is just the jumps. And this is also true for any very smooth uh, jump process. So for jump processes, just like you know the one we had before, the quadratic variation is just a sum of uh, jumps squared. And this is very nice. We know the rate of jumping, and we know now the quadratic variation. And for martingales, uh, you can use the quadratic variation to estimate the variance, for example. OK. So this will be our diffusion process eventually. Uh, we just take n independent copies of this uh, process, pt, and we treat it as a vector in Rn. And here I've drawn for you uh, several sample paths. Each color represents a different sample path in uh, three dimensions. It's a very abstract art. You can, you can print this sort of thing and hang it on your wall. My wife doesn't let me, but you know I would if I could. Okay. And you know, just like a Brownian motion um, is an FDA continuous time continuous diffusion process, FDA approved process, then this will be our uh, continuous time discrete diffusion process. And we will use it to prove functional inequalities for F. So like my intuition for all of this always is to think about this process as sort of a uh, discrete Brownian motion in a way. I mean, of course it doesn't have all the, you know, plus minus moving that, you know, all the erraticness that Brownian motion has, but this is like, the correct or a good diffusion process to think about that's moving inside the cube that tells you something about Boolean functions. Now you should be wary, of course. I mean, this is a continuous time process which takes values inside a solid cube, inside the continuous cube. And but we up until now we only talked about discrete functions f. So how do we how do we consolidate between the two? What do we do? So the first thing we have to do is we have to talk about how we can even use this real value process bt together with discrete input taking function f. And this is not too hard. Uh, every Boolean function has a Fourier decomposition into a polynomial, okay, or a sum of multilinear monomials as shown here. Um, these are just the characteristic functions. So you go over all subsets, there is some coefficient, and then this uh, monomial of uh, variables inside the subset. You can also uh, show that the derivative of a function has this uh, Fourier expansion. And it just so happens that uh, you know the discrete derivative and the Fourier they commute. So basically, if you look at the discrete derivative of uh, of a function and takes a Fourier decomposition, it's exactly like taking the you know real valued derivative of this polynomial. Well, now that we have this polynomial, this Fourier representation, it's really easy to to you know just treat it as a polynomial over the reals, and that's what we do. When we solidify the cube, we just plug in the process bt. So we define a new process, ft, and derivatives of ft, which we mark like so. And we just plug in the values of bt. Here, bt uh, parens i just means the i's coordinate of this n-valued uh, vector bt. And this, you know, this is a vector. When at time 0, bt's are all 0. So at time 0, we just have 0 everywhere. But as time progresses, all these BTs grow larger and you know, our functions take very different uh, values. Again, they can jump and, and do all of this sort of thing. Actually, yeah, when you plug in zero, all of these uh, terms vanish except for the one of the, you know, the empty set coefficient. And this is equal to the expectation of the function. So we start with the expectation of a function, basically. 
And then eventually, you know, at time one, all of these BTs will be either plus one or minus one. We reach some uniformly random discrete point on the cube. So you can think about it this way. We started a random point and we started, you know, uh, at the expected value of the function. And then we slowly build up more and more information about which value f is actually going to get until we reach the corner of the hypercube. And you can show that these two processes and you know any derivatives that you want, these are martingales, um, just because there's a sum of uh, independent copies of martingales as well, eventually. I would say that this is my favorite slide. You know, um, I think it's a cognitive dissonance talking owing to the incredible amount of time it took me to draw this, this picture over here. But um, I don't know, maybe it will be your favorite slide as well. Something to hang on the wall. So just, uh, just to see some examples of how this sort of thing might look like, um, if you simulate it, here, here is an example of a sample path. Okay, so I, I, I move my BT and I plug it into F and here is what F looks like. This specifically, I think is for the seven bit majority function. It's all my computer could, could handle. Again, you start at the expectation. So the majority function, just uh, you look at the number of bits. And if there is more, more ones than minus ones, then the output is one and, and vice versa. So in expectation, like the expected value is zero because you can always flip the bits if you want, flip all the bits and get the other result. So you always start at zero, but you always end at either plus one or, or minus one. And actually during all times in between, you will always be smaller than one or minus one because f of bt or ft here, it's uh, actually the weighted average of all possible values of f on the discrete cube. So here are some other sample paths that you can you know, enjoy just to get a feeling of, of what happens. By the way, uh, if you noticed, uh, the process jumps with rate one over two T, which means that near zero, there are infinitely many jumps. So, you know, there's lots of noise going, going around here, but uh, if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. It doesn't really matter that there are infinitely many jumps and all the calculations fall through. Okay, now I'm going to, to say how, how we can use this process to you know, say something about the various quantities that interested us, uh, that we are interested in, sorry, um, before, from before. So let's see how the variance of a function f can be bounded by an average over pass of processes bt. Uh, there will be some calculations here. So, and it's not too important to follow along exactly. So, you know, if you just want to get the rough feeling, that's okay. Um, don't, don't worry about this uh, too much. We will outline the important stuff. So if you see a square around something, that's, that's like something that you need to, see, to know. Okay, so let's combine the only two facts that we know, or the only two facts that I've told you so far. I mean, who knew that this uh, presentation actually leads to something? That first of all, you know, F, FT uh, jumps like a Poisson process. And so its quadratic variation is just the sum of uh, square of jumps. And second, that FT is a martingale. And so its variance is equal to the expected value of a quadratic variation. Putting these two simple facts together, we have that the variance of f is equal to the expected value of the sum of square of jumps. Okay, and here we have the process f, and here we have the quadratic variation of f. We can exactly see how it goes up whenever there's a jump in f, and it goes up by the square of the jump. So this is good. I mean, we wanted to say something, if you recall, we wanted to prove Lagrange's inequality, which says that the variance of f is smaller than something which has to do with influences and we already have something which talks about the variance of f that's good now we have to deal with this expression on the right hand side okay let's do that okay here are the calculations uh, that's not too bad so a friendly reminder here is how we wrote uh, the process ft it's just a sum of monomials so we can just look at every jump uh, you know what what the jumps do to every individual coordinate so what does uh, what happens um, when the jth coordinate of bt jumps, uh, this causes f to jump. And by how much? By 2t times the value of the monomial itself. Okay, so whenever I have this monomial and you know, I want to look at the jump, why, why, why did it jump? Why did the value jump? Because one of the actual uh, underlying bt diffusion processes jumped. And then in this case, you know, the jump is of size 2t times whatever else was you know, stayed constant. So it's this expression over here. And when we plug this into the, the Fourier decomposition of the function, we get uh, basically the derivatives. Okay, this looks exactly like the partial derivatives that we talked about before. And this is indeed true. 
And so we can write this sum of square of jumps as a sum of all coordinates. That's already good. Sum of all times where you know uh, every coordinate itself jumped and the size of the jump squared, which is 2t times the partial derivative i. Okay. And finally, uh, we recall that uh, we know the rate, okay? The, every process jumps at rate one over two t. So instead of going over all the jumps, I mean, we have this expectation over here. You can, you should trust me that we that uh, we can do what we're doing, gonna do now, which is to exchange the order of summation and say, let's go over all the individual points and ask what is the probability that you jump? Well, the probability that you jump is one over two t. And then this uh, sum becomes an integral. Okay. Lots of calculations. I know I glossed over some details. There are some details, but I said that I'll outline the important stuff and here is the important stuff. The variance of F is equal to the expectation, sum of all coordinates, this integral over here. And now we're in a good position because this is a, you know, I heard this is a webinar for probability and analysis. Now we have an integral and you know, some analytic expression. Now we can use analysis, okay? Tools for real analysis with integrals and derivatives and all of the stuff that we will know and love to bound this right-hand side. Questions so far? Comments, more of comments than questions, I don't know. Okay. So, you know, let's get proving. <laughs> so here is what we want to show on the right-hand side. The variance of F is smaller than some constant sum of all coordinates, the influence, the ice influence divided by, you know, this uh, denominator, log of one over the ice influence. That's what we want. What do we have? That the variance is equal to two times the sum of this integral. How very convenient, I would say, um, that we have a sum over here and sum over here. Basically, all we have to show is that this integral is uh, smaller than, you know, this expression over here involving the influences. <clears throat> very natural. And how do we do this? That's uh, the question you might ask. Um, we will use something called the level one inequality, which goes as follows. So suppose we have a function G, which uh, is a harmonic extension of a function. By harmonic extension, I mean the same Fourier decomposition that we had before. So, you know, we started with a Boolean function, uh, which only took values on the discrete cube, and then using the Fourier decomposition, extended it to be on the closed cube, okay, on the continuous cube. So we have one such function, and suppose we, we plug in a vector x where all the coordinates have the same magnitude. So you can think of it just as bt, okay, exactly this bt that we have here. I mean, this is exactly the condition. Then the norm of the gradient of g is bounded by this expression over here, okay, which consists, what, what we need to, to know, what we need to take home is that uh, it consists of this uh, g itself, okay? So the norm of the gradient of g, norm squared, is smaller than some constant, L is some constant, times G squared or times log of one over G. So the right-hand side is a function of G and the left-hand side is a function of the gradient of G. Okay, lots of explanation to do here uh, for those who haven't seen it yet. So first of all, what, what's, what's up with the name? Or what is the level one inequality? I mean, this is not like a video game or anything. So why is level, why level one? Let's set X equal to zero. Okay, so here T is equal to, to zero everywhere. As we mentioned earlier, when we plug zero into a uh, harmonic extension of a function, we just get its expectation. So the left-hand side, it's just the sum of expected values of, of the derivative. But uh, you know, the expected values of the derivative, it can be shown is the first level coefficient, Fourier coefficient, okay? So we have this uh, g hat of, uh, of the, how is it called, singleton of, uh, of i, direction i. So this gradient over here is basically the sum of squares of the first uh, level coefficients, which is also called the Fourier weight of on the first level. That's like the terminology in Boolean functions. So that's level one. And on the right-hand side, again, using the fact that when you plug in zero, you get expectations, you just get you know, the expected value of G, which is the zeroth level coefficient in the Fourier decomposition. So basically this is a, an inequality which relates the first level coefficients uh, it's bounds it by zero level coefficients. This is what it does. Or if you want, uh, it bounds the Fourier mass on the first level by Fourier mass on the zero level. And there's an entire class of these inequalities. They are aptly named level K inequalities, which bounds the Fourier mass on the K level by those on lower levels. So there's like uh, many of these, but we only be using this one for our purposes. 
And of course, this was only for x equals zero. If you take x equal t, then you can think of it like a, it's the same thing, but for biased Fourier analysis. But we won't go over here. Just think of x as equal to zero, basically. And now, now is the point where I ask uh, if this uh, expression looks familiar to anyone. In fact, there's a really similar inequality for Gaussian spaces. Okay, so not for Boolean, not for Boolean spaces, but for Gaussian spaces. Um, if you know it, that, that's, that's good, but we'll just uh, do a quick review. So suppose that A is a set in Rn, okay? I've drawn it here in green for n equal two. Um, and gamma is a Gaussian measure on the space. Then this inequality holds true, okay? So you go over all of A, look at, uh, integrate its X value. So basically this is the center of mass of the set. Uh, it's a vector. Look at the norm squared of this vector. It's smaller than the size of the set squared times log of one over the size of the set. And this is, of course, by size, I mean, you know, the Gaussian measure. And, um, you know, so here is uh, the center and, you know, we have this inequality over here. And for this uh, inequality, we also know the maximizers as always. They are half places or half planes, if you want. Um, to see this, you can think of it this way. Like I want to maximize uh, the size of this, uh, you know, the center of mass. Then I want to push everything to the other side of the center of mass, right? If I have mass over here, uh, you know, between the center of mass and zero, I want to move it to the other side. And then this basically, you basically get a half plane and you just get a one dimensional inequality and proving this is you know, just Gaussian tail estimates eventually. Um, but let me just compare it to the level K inequality or to the level zero, level one inequality that we talked about before. It's basically the same thing, right? We talked about the gradient of the function G and you can do the calculation and see that this actually also talks about the center of mass of G in a way. And these two expressions are basically identical. But whereas uh, in Gaussian space, uh, maximizers are half spaces, in the Boolean cube, the maximizers are Hamming balls, okay? Just like the one I've drawn over here. So you take a point, you take a vertex, and you look at all the, the uh, vertices from some distance, up to some distance away from it. These are the maximizers. So if you know this inequality, uh, it might give you some intuition about this level one inequality. And if you don't know this inequality, then that's good. I mean, more inequalities, that's better for us in life, I guess. So any questions uh, about this? Why there is power four? Um, I, I guess this is like an artifact of the calculation. This might be improve, improved. Um, I won't be using this constant here at all. I mean, I'll, I'll just bound it by, you know, 32 or something because I'll take it for small t. So I don't care about this. I don't have a, any better answer, I guess. <clears throat> okay. So now we have a very nice tool, the level, level one inequality. How do we use it? Um, we will use it, of course, to bound this integrand over here by taking the function g to be the derivative in direction i. So partial if, this will be our function g. Okay, let's see how to do that. Again, some technical details. Uh, don't we won't worry about them too much. Okay, so we start with uh, with the following. Let's take the derivative of the expression that's found inside here. You will have to believe me or read the paper, you know, at, at your own leisure, that this derivative equals to two times the expectation of the gradient. I mean, okay, like if you do, you know, the, if you apply the chain rule, you almost you basically get this. Okay, it's basically the chain rule plus you know martingaleness and not not much else. So we have this uh, expectation of the gradient of partial i of f. Ah, great. But this is exactly the expression that we know from the level one inequality. So we use this to bound, uh, to bound it by you know, uh, partial i of f itself. And this is good. I mean, what do we have? We basically have a uh, differential inequality. OK, this side. Uh, OK, sorry, I, I skipped a step. So now we take uh, only small values of t, and we use Jensen's inequality. And basically, we have that this left-hand side over here is smaller than the expected value of the i's derivative squared times log of you know one over this. So we've basically uh, bounded this the derivative of an expression by the expression itself. Okay, we have a uh, differential inequality, and we can solve it. Like if you put it into Mathematica, it will it will solve it for you. But you can also like do it by hand if you're clever, um, and you just get you know a bound or an exponential bound. 
So the size of this expression over here is always smaller than some constant k for small enough t. It's always smaller than some constant k times the value at zero, right? Differential inequality. We have we need to have you know initial conditions times e and to the power of e to the minus ct. Cool. Okay, but we know that the value at time zero, it's just the expected value of this expression. Ah, but we said at the beginning in the first slides that the expected value of the, of, uh, the derivative squared is just the influence. So this is you know, just bounded by the influence to the power of, of this thing over here, which is great. And it looks sort of like this, if you recall that the inference is smaller than one. I mean, you can already see how we're going towards what, what we want to prove, right? Um, we have the expected value of, uh, in our inequal original equalities, you know, what we started with, we have the expected value of the derivative, and now we show that, at least for small times t, the expected value of the derivative is bounded by something related to the influence. That's, that's good for us, that's what we want to show in the end. Okay, and this is the last slide of calculations, I promise you that. Um, we use this inequality. After a simple ch time change, you can show this inequality. Okay, so you, instead of t, we use e to the minus t, and then we input some time gamma. And we have that, uh, you know, there exists some time gamma, small enough, or large enough, sorry, so that uh, at this time, our uh, derivative is bounded by, you know, this expression that you see over here. And then using long convexity, all we have to take care, take home with us is that uh, this expression is bounded by the influence to the power of one over some you know small small thing. And now we are done. Okay, final calculations. You can verify this at home. Um, we start with our variance, which we again obtained using the quadratic variation and the fact that we know the rate of the jumps. Uh, we bound, you know, we turn this integral around, opa, and uh, by making time change. And now we apply this uh, inequality here. We break the integral into two parts, okay, from zero to gamma and from gamma to infinity. The first integral is bounded uh, because of our level one inequality, and the second integral is bounded by exponential decay. And you know, if you want to get some sort of intuition, basically what we say is that about these different domains, uh, in the first, the jumps of f, you know, they could be a large. I mean, okay, what, what contributes to the variance? The jumps of f, as we said before. So the jumps of f could be large. But the function decreases very rapidly, so there is actually very little contribution. And in the second contribution, the, the jumps of f are very small, you know, regardless. So we don't care about that. So we've basically bounded the average size of the average square size of the jumps of f. And after you do these very unwholesome integrations um, represented by these cogs, eventually you just get a Lagrange inequality, it just pops out of the integrals. And you know, that's like QED over here. Okay, so. I know there's a bit of calculation. The, the actual pretty part is, is the next part, but I just wanted to show how you can do this um, using our, our process. So we used the uh, quadratic variation, the fact that it's a, a jump process and the level one inequality. Then we had to massage it a bit, got some integrals that we can analyze with uh, differential inequalities. Okay, so tools from you know, real analysis. And then we got Talagrand's inequality, which I think is very nice. And um, those of you who are in the know, okay, maybe before that, any questions? Okay. So those of you who are in the know may have noticed that maybe I cheated a little, um, not mathematically, all the calculations are, are correct. I, I assure you of that. It would be a disgrace to cheat mathematically, but with what I promised, because in the beginning, I said that our proof is different from all these hyper-contractive inequalities, you know, in Markov, uh, heat semi-group operator kind of things. But in fact, Talagrand proved the same inequality with hypercontractivity. And this, you know, wh wherever we use this integral and everything, we can also prove this using hyperconductivity. So basically we worked a bit too hard, okay, to, to do what we wanted. And, and that's true. I mean, all, all, we, all we did, we used the expected value of the derivative, which as I said before, looks something like this. But if you only want the expected value, you don't have to go with all these, you know, BTs and, and everything. You can just look at what happens at the end. I mean, we're not using the we're not using the actual power of the stochastic process. We're not using the sample paths themselves. Yeah, sorry. Okay. And um, so the real fun begins when you use BT when you actually look at what the actual paths do when they build up the expectations. Okay. So, you know, instead of this expectation, let's look at the paths themselves and they, they can look in all sorts of ways. And all these ways together make up this uh, expected value. 
And to show you, you know, that you can do something with this, we'll quickly in a couple of minutes uh, prove stability for the process. And what do I mean by stability? Again, um, the starting point is that the variance, now it's larger than this Telegram's you know, quantity on the right-hand side. And our goal is to show that the vertex boundary is large. And what do we do? What, what do we know? Okay, so we know that the variance is equal to the sum of squares of jumps, which is equal to the expected value of the quadratic variation. Ah, but if it's equal to the expected value of the quadratic variation, then we can look at you know, how the quadratic variation actually behaves. And it can be shown you know, after a bit of analysis that I won't show here, that in some sense, small jumps are not enough. That is that if you only look on, on you know, paths where you have small jumps, then you just don't get enough quadratic variation to make the variance large. But you know, this is impossible. The variance has to be large because this is our initial assumption. So if you analyze the path, you, 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 you know, come to the conclusion that there have to be many paths or you know, reasonably many paths where there are large jumps. That's what you get eventually. And by, I mean, you have to, you know, rigorously quantify it. What do I mean by reason, you know, reasonable probability? Um, just do it just a bit over here. So just slight technicalities. So if I, for some number alpha, if I denote the event F alpha, the event that there exists some jump somewhere where the function jumped by a, fun by a value of over alpha, then this probability is, has to be at least slightly large. And by slightly large, I mean C times var alpha, var F. And we will take, you know, uh, alpha will depend on this C prime over here. And this small C will also depend on this C prime over here. But if you think about all of these as constants, then all of these are constants. Okay. So like, you know, how good a probability we get really depends on how good this, this uh, in other reverse inequality holds. So just to summarize, small jumps, not enough, can't build up a good variance using only small jumps in the quadratic variation. So we have to have a reasonable probability of having at least one large jump. <clears throat> and the proof of this is not too hard, but it's really also not too interesting, unfortunately. So let's just take it for granted. And what do we do now when we have this? We define a variant of our original diffusion process. We call it uh, the hesitant process. And we use, uh, like we, you know, we alter the original process in a very uh, mischievous way. So this process piggybacks on the original process. And you know, if the original process flipped signs at the rate of one over two T, now this process jumps at the rate of a one over T. So it jumps twice as much, you know, an expectation. But uh, sometimes it's, you know, in half those jumps, it goes back to where it started. So we have this process, it goes, it goes, goes, it jumps and continues, but sometimes it jumps and then goes back, jumps and then goes back. So sometimes, you know, it regrets its actions and goes back. On the others, it continues. And you can show that this uh, process is also a martingale, although no longer a right continuous martingale. And now we can still, so we can still use, you know, some of the good properties, but maybe not, not all of them. Okay, I mean, you can, you can maybe see where this is going. I mean, we're always talking about small jumps, large jumps, sometimes you go back, sometimes you go forward. Now we just have to put like everything, uh, everything together. So we defined by tau, okay, to be the smallest time where there was some derivative, which is large, which basically means that there was a large jump, right? Because the jumps uh, depend on the size of the derivatives. And not only that, but at this time, okay, so the just hesitant process took the value of zero. And here is, by the way, here's a sample path of what F might look like. There's all these spikes, you know, you start jumping, but then you, you know, you regret, you go back. So the measure of the outer vertex boundary is, of course, just the probability that this modified hesitant uh, ver uh, process is in the, you know, in the, in the outer vertex boundary because it still always ends at plus minus one, you know. So it's always at time one, it's always on the discrete hypercube. And you can just condition on the event that you know there was this uh, large jump. And as we said before, this probability of having a large jump it's at least you know the variance. So all we have to do is just bound this over thing, this thing over here by some constant, all right? And then we ex get exactly what I promised you in the theorem. We get that the size of the vertex boundary or the index vertex boundary is larger than some constant, once we show that this is a constant, times the variance of f. And I mean, this is like, it follows very naturally. So when time, when tau is smaller than one, that means that there was a derivative with a very large, uh, was very large, okay? I mean, there was a large jump. 
But because this derivative is a martingale, that, that means that it, it also has a very large probability of reaching one at the end, right? A martingale, once you know that its value is uh, fixed, then you know that it's going to be to stay large in expectation. So the probability is that you know the partial derivative, the derivative, the ith derivative at time one, it's equal to one. That means that when you change the the value, you change the value of the function by one, it's large. It's larger than some constant alpha. But also when tau is smaller than one, we know that the hesitant process was at zero. Okay, which means that it has two options: either it jumps up or it jumps down. Okay, it can continue to be either way. So that means that it can go either way, you know, plus minus one at the end, equally likely. So eventually the probability that it will be either at plus one or at minus one is half. And if you combine these two facts together using the fact that these two events are actually independent, you get exactly this. Because right, if you are in the outer vertex boundary and your value is one and the derivative is one, then uh, I'm sorry, not even, then you're in the outer vertex boundary or in expected boundary. I always get uh, those two mixed up, right? Um, if you flip the coordinate and change the value, which is basically what this derivative is saying, then all the ones you're in the inner or outer only depends on whether this is plus one or minus one. So that's basically what you get. So putting these two together, you get that this quantity here is smaller than a con larger than a constant, and then this entire thing is larger than a constant, and we show what you did. So we could only do this sort of analysis using actual analysis of, of the path. Okay. And I see that I only have like uh, one minute left. So just a couple of open questions. Um, maybe we, you know, we can analyze some other functionals of the process and not just the gradient. Um, maybe we can say something about first batch of speculation and its variance. I won't expand too much about all these things here. Maybe we can talk about it later. And I'll just say that uh, don't solve all of these at once or I will not have anything to work on for my doctorate. Okay. And I think, um, you know, let's, let's finish with that. That's the end for now. Um, I'm open to questions or comments or whatever. Thank you, Rena. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, okay, are there any questions? I... I have a question. Um, in the very first isoparametric inequality that you wrote, and you mentioned that subcubes are extremizers, subcubes have measured two to the k, right? Yes, so to the, the minus k. So you can characterize those sets uh, which have this measure and which are extremizers. But if they don't have measured two to the k, then it's not necessarily true that you have a quality there, right? Wait, uh, let me go back up. So what, what right. again? My question is, let's take sets A, capital A, such that measure of capital A is not two to the K. It's a different yes. number. Yes. Then uh, we don't have sets which attain equality. I'm just um, trying right. to check that. Right, right. Right. Um, yes, so uh, we don't have sets which attain equality. You know, what uh, what you can do, of course, is say something about sets which almost attain equality. So let's say you you uh, attain equality up to epsilon. So it's you know suppose that the sum of inferences is smaller than two times one plus epsilon times maybe some other small additive thing or something like that. So there are works you know in this direction, and what we did is so something about multiple multiple multiplicative constants. Yeah. I mean, but it's fine that you don't have uh, maximizers for every, you know, for every uh, weight. I mean, this is not continuous space where you can squeeze things as you want. Okay, uh, I got in the chat suggestion, someone wanted suggestion for some papers. Um, so, you know, this is still rather new, but yeah, I, I got suggestions for you. Let's see. So there is already a, a paper which uh, uses our process to expand Telegram's inequality for uh, Banach spaces. So this is always good reading. And um, let's see, if you want to read Telegram's original papers, they are always a pleasure. I just, uh, how much? So there's this one, Rousseau's approximated zero one law, and also Telegrand has a, a paper called uh, 
how much are increasing sets positively correlated, and also one on, on boundaries and influences. So these are all good papers to read. Um, maybe I'll, yeah, okay. Wrote it in the chat for those who want to to do that. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question, but it's too noisy here, so I don't know. And it's hard to uh, announce or paraphrase. Basically, uh, it's a question rather not on the uh, the model that you presented but on the knowledge representation of that model but on what sorry the knowledge representation for example if i look at any uh, cube or hypercube if i can reduce that to a simple boolean expression and even go beyond and uh, get a carnot map and to minimize that the question is whether from the perspective of a Poisson process, it should be considered like a, as a unique solution, or if it's much more, the hypercube can be more dynamic, uh, say uh, much more what you could do with predicate logic and expression, and, which is a segmented process. In other words, the, the Boolean solution is a general solution. Whereas in a particular logic where you can use a relational calculus, you have to go segment by segment. If something is in parentheses, then that's the output to the next, uh, you know, uh, portion of the expression and so on, and you solve the parentheses first. So in this scenario, where this Poisson process is represented or should be looked at as a segmented process, or simply I look at it as uh, I can transform this into a Boolean expression, which whose solution is uh, in a way deterministic. And uh, mm. so that's the idea. So, so, so basically this Poisson process, uh, it encodes randomness. So I don't, I don't think you will ever get uh, it's not gonna be deterministic, something either. deterministic. Um, Again, you can think of it like uh, at, at the very at the very beginning, you don't know anything about you know what your function is going to look like, what value it's going to take, and this process helps you build up randomness or build up bits of information about where eventually what value your function is going to take. So yeah. I only know that you can apply this to to the Fourier representations and not to anything nested like you know trees or circuits. Uh, I don't know how you can apply apply this to circuits or something like this. Uh, okay. Yes, it, it's very interesting because it's two different, two different problems in computer science. And uh, I think if we apply these principles onto those two, then uh, we could have a different paradigm to look at it, you know, two different. So if you have uh, the segmented process, like in predicate logic or relational uh, calculus, then then it's, it's uh, obviously a truthful, true for some process. Whereas if we just think about it as, uh, uh, as a Boolean problem, then we just have uh, all the output of all the entries and it's just like a circuit design, that's it. So that's the, the difference. And then this uh, model that you present would have different significance in each scenario. Okay, uh, let's uh, thanks. Uh, let's thank the speaker again, and I will stop the recording. Uh, uh, thank you.